All right. Good evening. Turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. We're going to note 1 Timothy 4, 7 this evening, where Paul commands Timothy to continue rejecting worldly myths, which are like old wives' tale, he says. And then he says, in contrast to this, Timothy is to continue training himself for godliness. So we're going to see that Paul uses an athletic track and field uh, metaphor here in this passage. And uh, so we're going to have some cool things to talk about. Uh, in this passage with uh, regards to growing up to be like Jesus Christ and what godliness is all about. We've studied that a couple, several times in this epistle, and we're going to be uh, talking about it and learning some more things about it here uh, this evening. And so without further ado, let's take that moment of silent prayer. And uh, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let's pray. Heads bowed and eyes closed. I didn't say the other way. <laughs> My eyes, eyes bowed and heads closed. <laughs> Let us pray. Father, we just thank you for this time to gather together with each other as members of the royal family of God to learn about your plan through the study of your word. We thank you for the gift of the Spirit which makes this possible and also the work of your Son at the cross and his resurrection and placing us in union with him through the baptism of the Spirit, identifying us with your Son in his crucifixion, his death, his burial, his resurrection and session so that now we're seated at your right hand, we're children of God, sons of God, and that you now view us as you view your son. And we just thank you, Father, for the forgiveness of our sins, and we thank you for loving us through both your son and the spirit and the work that they have performed on our behalf. Father, we pray that the Holy Spirit would continue to help us understand the implications of this union and identification with your son so that we could appropriate your power by faith and experience our deliverance over sin and Satan because of that union and identification with your son. Help us to derive our spiritual self-esteem and our personal sense of destiny as a result of this position in Christ. And Father, we just thank you for giving us your plan, relating it to us through the word and the spirit to become like your son, Jesus Christ. So Father, help us to order our priorities according to that plan. Uh, help us to concentrate upon that objective and to pray with that objective in mind and also to pray for other believers with that objective in mind. And Father, we pray, Father, that you would uh, continue uh, to uh, give us insight and understanding into this book that we've been studying, First Timothy. We pray that this study would be a blessing to the body of Christ now and in the future. We thank you, Father, for the Thompsons opening up their home. And we thank you, Father, not only for them, but also the people who are faithful and listening on Pal Talk and people who will be coming in this evening and listening to the class or watching it through Pal Talk, and also at a later date through the website. And we pray, Father, that you would help those in the audience to concentrate, help them to understand the implications and apply them to their lives, their walk with you. We also pray that you would give grace to myself so that I could deliver to your people everything that they need that you want them to hear this evening in your word. So, and as a result, Father, they would continue to grow and the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and you and your Son, Jesus Christ, would be glorified. So, Father, we pray for these things in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. You should be at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. As I noted a few moments ago, we're going to note 1 Timothy 4, 7, where the Apostle Paul issues Timothy two commands. Now, the first one, he requires that Timothy continue rejecting worldly myths, which he says are like old wives' tales. We're going to know what that's all about. And then on the heels of this, he gives another command where he requires Timothy to continue training himself for godliness. So we're getting into the section where Paul's going to start addressing Timothy uh, and uh, his, uh, his personal uh, uh, responsibilities in light of the apostasy and uh, heresy in Ephesus. But he's going to still continue to talk to the Ephesian congregation through Timothy, his delegate, here in verses 6 uh, through 10. Remember, we're in the second uh, division of the chapter. Remember, 1 Timothy chapter 4 is divided into three divisions, three sections. We have in verse, verses 1 through 5, 
uh, Paul discussing the content of the Judaizers' false teaching, their false doctrine, which originated with the kingdom of darkness, as we noted. And uh, then we uh, also in that passage, we noted the correct doctrine where Paul uh, t t says, uh, refutes uh, the, the, for instance, Paul said that they, the Judaizers forbid marriage and abstaining from certain foods. The, the latter, Paul uh, explains why that is uh, wrong. And he explains that it's the Lord's teaching that he said that, the Lord said that you could eat all foods. He doesn't even bother explaining the first one because it's so ludicrous. And now when we get to the verses 6, and ten, six through 10, we have the second division of the chapter, and then that's followed by verses 11 through 16, the third and final division of the chapter, which discusses personally, uh, t t Paul and Timothy get real personal, and Paul uh, reminds Timothy of the things that he wanted Timothy to do, specifically what he wanted Timothy to to do, and he's going to do this in verse 7 here this evening. In 1 Timothy 4, 7, he issues two commands, as I said before. The first is that he, it's, in a neg it's, a, it's one that's a prohibition, where he says, I don't want you to get involved uh, to uh, reject that, actually. I want you to reject worldly myths, and he describes these worldly myths, which we noted actually in 1 Timothy chapter 1. He uh, describes them as like old wives' tales. And then on the heels of that, as I also mentioned before, he requires that Timothy continue training himself for godliness. And that's the command that we're going to have a little bit of fun with because it's a track and field metaphor. He's taking uh, Paul, he was a man of his times, and sports was very big in, in Roman Gre Greco-Roman society. When I say Greco-Roman society, I'm saying that the Roman Empire was dominating at that time in the first century, and Greek ideas, Greek thought and philosophy, and Greek uh, concepts were predominant in the Roman Empire. And one of the things the Greeks liked to do was they liked to exercise. They were into sports. And they're the ones that came up with the idea of the Olympic Games. So Paul's going to take from uh, the sports, he's going to take a sports meta, uh, uh, take from sports in the Roman, in the Greco-Roman society, and in particular the different various games that were, uh, that they had, like the Olympic Games, which is the most famous today, but they also had the Isthmian Games were probably even bigger, and the Corinthian Games. All these various games, which we'll talk about, had uh, uh, certain events. And one of those events was uh, the foot race, the 200-yard foot race. And the stone pillar, uh, the square stone pillar, marked the finish line. They, used to have, they have tape now to go across. But in the ancient world, it was a square stone pillar that was the, marked the finish line. And we're going to see that Paul wants Timothy to exercise himself to discipline himself, train himself, so that he could cross the finish line, which is, in, in the spiritual uh, realm, that is to become like Jesus Christ, to obtain the objective of becoming like Jesus Christ, to do the Father's will for our lives, is the finish line. And so Paul's saying, I want you to train yourself to do this. I want you to train yourself for godliness, and we're going to have a lot to say about godliness. We've spoken about it several times, the word Absevia, translated godliness, we've seen it many times already in this epistle, and we're going to note it in greater detail this evening, uh, but with regards to Timothy and his walk with God. And some of the things we're learning from Timothy, what Paul says to Timothy here, we'll find application, we'll find the implications of this in our day and age as Christians here in the 21st century. Now look at First Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Paul says, but the Spirit explicitly says that in later times some will fall away from the faith by paying attention to deceitful spirits and specifically, doctrines originating from de demons. Note the translation. By means of the hypocrisy of liars, or those who produce falsehood. And he says, they're seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. Verse 3. Men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods, which God has created to be greatly shared in by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected, so that it's received with gratitude. Note the translation again. Then he says in verse 5, For it, all foods, are sanctified by means of the word of God, Jesus Christ's teaching, and prayer. And as we saw, prayer is our side. We can't experience, we can't experience these food that has been set apart for us if we don't take on faith the Lord's teaching that you could eat all foods. Prayer is an expression of that faith. Thanksgiving and prayer is an expression of that faith in the Lord's teaching that you could eat all foods. And then we have verse 6. 
as we noted uh, last week and on Sunday, and pointing out these things, the things he just mentioned in verses 1 through 5, to the brethren, his fellow Christians in Ephesus, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, meaning you'll serve him excellently, constantly not nourished, but actually saw instructed uh, by the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine which you have been following. Now let me give you my translation. I actually look at verse 7 before I give you my translation. Then he says in verse 7, But have nothing to do with worldly fables, fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Now let me read you the, my translation of those verses because my translation for you is an interpretive translation which we're going to uh, find out how I got to this translation in our study of verse 7 here this evening or at least one of the, the translation of one of the verses. Look at, uh, listen to my translation of the first seven verses in 1 Timothy chapter 4. However, the Spirit ha explicitly has said and it applies at this present moment that in later times certain individuals will allow themselves to abandon the Christian faith by being occupied with deceitful spirits, specifically doctrines originating from demons, by means of hypocrisy produced by those who speak falsehood, who have seared their own conscience, those who forbid marriage, those who command abstinence from foods, which God the Son created for the purpose of partaking with thanksgiving for the benefit of believers, specifically for the benefit of those who possess an experiential knowledge of the truth, because each and every creature produced by God the Son is as an eternal spiritual truth undefiled. In other words, absolutely nothing is as an eternal spiritual truth rejected. Consequently, it is always to be received with thanksgiving. For you see, it is an eternal spiritual truth sanctified by means of the word originating from God the Son as well as prayer. By you regularly pointing out these things for the benefit of your spiritual brothers and sisters, you yourself will be excellently serving Christ who is Jesus. Specifically, you by you yourself regularly instructing them by means of these words originating from the Christian faith. In other words, that which is accurate teaching, which for your benefit you are adhering to. Verse 7, But you yourself continue making it your havoc of rejecting worldly myths. Yes, old wives' tales at that. Rather continue making it your habit of disciplining yourself for the purpose of godliness. Now let's look at verse 7 in the New American Standard which says, But have nothing to do with worldly fables, fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Now that adversative clause, but have nothing to do with worldly fables, fit only for old women, is composed of several words in the Greek. We have the con conjunction the, translated here correctly, but. And then we have the articular accusative form of the adjective, thevilos, translated worldly. It speaks of the cosmic system of Satan. And then we have the conjunction ke, which is, translated, which is not translated here. And that's followed by the accusative plural form of the adjective, graothis, which is translated fit only for old women. And this is followed by another accusative, a word that's a noun. It's the word mythos, translated fables. We saw this in chapter 1, this word. And it's found in, first, in Titus chapter 1. And it's speaking of those myths of the Judaizers from their incorrect interpretation of the Old Testament genealogies. And then we have a verb. We have the, uh, an imperative, which means a command. We have a present middle imperative form of the verb par parateoma. Parateoma means have nothing to do with here in this verse, or it's translated by the New American Standard that way. As we'll see, it means to reject. He wants Timothy, with this word, he's commanding him to re continue rejecting these worldly myths. So that word, parateoma, it's translated here, have nothing to do with. Now, the word that is translated but here, the word the, it's introducing a command that stands in contrast with verse 6 which reminds Timothy of his responsibility to regularly instruct the Ephesians with regards to Paul's teaching uh, concerning or pertaining to marriage and food in order to protect them from the demonically inspired teaching of the Judea Judaizers. Now, one of the very important, most important things you got to do, one of the most important things you got to do when you teach the Bible and you interpret and then you want to explain passages to Christians, 
One of the things that's really lacking, I, I see with a lot of teaching, is we, when we look at a verse, we got to look at the relationship of the verse for, or, the, or a clause in relation to what it just, in the other sentences or clauses that came before it. And so that's why I point out this conjunction, the, because it's telling us the relationship with the command here in, ver in verse 6, with the command he now has, or the, adverse, uh, the prohibition he has in verse 7. It's because that helps us understand the passage. See, you can't learn doctrine if you don't know what the passage says in the Bible. And what, and now, with the, it was a great translation here by the New American Standard, so without looking at the Greek, you could find the relationship because they rendered it, in my opinion, accurately. So uh, the word here that's translated but is telling us that the statement being uh, introduced by this word is a, it stands in contrast with verse 6. And verse 6, we saw that Timothy, was Paul reminds Timothy of his responsibility in regularly instructing the Ephesians with regards to Paul's teaching pertaining to marriage and food in order to protect the Ephesians from the demonically inspired teaching of the Judaizers, which he speaks about in detail in the first five verses. Now, here in verse 7, Paul's going to issue Timothy another command, this time to continue rejecting worldly myths. It's actually a prohibition. And he says that these old uh, worldly myths are nothing but old, old wives' tale. And then he follows this up with a command for Timothy, as he said before, to continue training himself for godliness. So uh, knowing that, what the sixth verse says and what the seventh verse says, we could say that the contrast between these two verses, which is being marked by this conjunction, the, translated but, in verse 7, is that it's a contrast between Timothy fulfilling his responsibilities with respect to the gospel and not doing so because of being occupied with irreverent, silly myths, or in other words, he's to avoid the false doctrine of the Judaizers. So what Paul's kind of, was subtly doing, remember this epistle, the occasion of this epistle, to straighten out the pastors in Ephesus. So no doubt Paul was going to tell, uh, Timothy was going to tell, as commanded by Paul, to tell these guys to stop teaching false doctrine, stop trying to be teachers of the law. I want you to teach the gospel, and as we've noted in detail. So what he's saying to Timothy here is a subtle rebuke to those pastors who were involved in the, 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 the silly myths of the Judaizers and being in, misinterpreting the genealogies of Genesis to come up with these myths and emphasizing the Ten Commandments. And so we see that Paul, by talking to Timothy this way in verse 7, he's subtly rebuking those pastors in Ephesus who did fall for the teaching of the Judaizers. Because Paul's saying, contrasting Timothy, fulfilling his, his responsibilities with respect to the gospel, and, and, and on the other hand, not doing so. This is what you should be doing, Timothy, which he was, and this is what you should not be doing. So he's contrasting here. And so we see here that it's false doctrine is to be rejected. False doctrine is so important to reject for the Christian. But if you don't know your Bible... You're not going to have any discernment to understand what's false doctrine. One of the jobs of a pastor is to protect you from false doctrine. And, and, and you see too much of this going on where we, once you reject the authority of the pastor, authority which Jesus Christ gave the pastor, and it doesn't matter if you like him or you don't want, you don't want to submit. The issue is you obey him. And this is where you get... A lot, once you reject the authority of the pastor, and I know a lot of Christians don't want to accept it, but they're going to, pay, they're going to have to stand for the consequences for that rejection because they're going to have to give an account as to why they rejected the authority of their pastor, which Jesus Christ delegated to the pastor. The pastor, one of his jobs is to protect you. By teaching you sound doctrine, he's going to protect you from the lies because once you learn sound doctrine, you're going to be able to discern what is the truth and what's a lie? Like, for instance, we've been studying the first Sunday of the month on the day we uh, celebrate the Lord's table. We study about the person of Christ. One of the reasons why I did that is I think it's very important that we understand Jesus Christ, who he is. He's both God and man, the relationships between his divine nature and his human nature, and the passages which say that he's deity and also humanity, and that he pre-existed, he always existed, and he, because he's eternal. And we, uh, we're next uh, coming, this coming month, we're going to study about the impeccability of Christ, and that he is sinless, 
And so we, we, the Christians need to know that because all the cults all start off with misunderstanding the person of Christ. And, or they reject the Trinity. They make the Spirit out to be a force rather than a person. They deny the personality of the Spirit. And they also deny the deity of Christ in our day and age. But back in Paul's day, the deity of Jesus of Nazareth was never questioned. What was really attacked by the enemy, the kingdom of darkness, was the human nature of Jesus Christ. That's where the Gnostics in the second century, from then on, they pounded on that. Because they, they said, no, he wasn't really a human being, he was a phantom. That's called ascetic Gnosticism. So by learning what the Bible says and the apostles say, and Jesus about the hypostatic union, and what, that Jesus Christ is both God and man, that's going to protect us from the false doctrine because people are going to come in and say, no, Jesus wasn't God, and can you defend it? Can you go to the Bible and say, here it is? Can you do that? You're, you, have an, you are required to do that. First, Tim, First Peter 3.15, we're to give an account for the hope that's in us, the confident expectation of blessing that is in us. So by the pastor communicating sound doctrine, uh, he is going to protect you. That's one of his jobs. In fact, hold your place briefly. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Look at verse 11. So if you know Christians who don't have a pastor, or, and I've, I've known churches that don't have pastors, they're sheep without a shepherd. And you know what? They're all going to be eaten up by wolves, and they're never, they're never going to grow to spiritual maturity. You can't go to grow to spiritual maturity without a pastor. There's no, that's why the pastor gave you, was given to you by God, so you could grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ and grow up to spiritual maturity. His gift the exercise of the pastor's gift is designed so that you could be some equipped to serve, to use your spiritual gift. And with you don't have a pastor, you're a dead meat for the kingdom of darkness. In fact, if you know of your pastor and you've rejected him, then you are living in disobedience to God and you're going to be disciplined for it. God wants, has given the gift of pastor teacher to protect you from false doctrine, to feed you the word of God so you could learn to use your gift so you could function in the body of Christ by what he gives you. Look at Ephesians 4.11. Speaking of the four great communication gifts, two of which are still today, around today. He says in verse 11, and he, Jesus Christ in context, Ephesians 4.11, gave some of them as apostles and prophets. They're no longer existent. The apostles all died in the first century. The prophets were gone once, the completed canon, we, once we had the completed canon of the scripture at the end of the first century. And then we have some as evangelists. Their gift is directed toward the unsaved. And then it, it's not two different offices. It's one office, and it says the pastors, and you can put a hyphen there, pastors, teachers, or the figure of head, the artist says, teaching pastors. And the pastor, that word pastor, it speaks of his authority. Just like a shepherd is a th has authority over the sheep, and is to use that authority to protect the sheep. The word teaching Teacher means that's his function. That's how he protects the body of Christ, the flock of God, teaching. Now, put, now what's the implication? Think about, think about certain churches. How much of the pastor teaching there? Because that tells you a lot. It tells you a lot. It tells you if they're not teaching very often, and just on Sundays and maybe at most an hour, is that enough to protect the body of Christ? Is it enough? To, are they getting enough spiritual food, uh, spiritual nourishment to grow up the spiritual maturity? I don't believe that you could teach once on Sunday and grow and learn once on Sunday and grow to spiritual maturity. I, I doubt that seriously. In fact, the early first century churches we saw on Sunday and in the past taught every day. Okay, and So we teach four times a week, and some people think we're fanatics because of that. That's too bad. But look at the next. Here's the threefold purpose. For the gifts. For the equipping of the saints. For what? For the work of service. Are you using your spiritual gift? Do you know what your spiritual gift is? If you've been a believer for any length of time, you better know your gift. Because God will identify it for you. Some Christians don't want to accept what God's told them their gift because they want to be out front. They have other ideas rather than what God has to say. So it says, it says for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service. To the building up of the body of Christ spiritually until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge 
Are you growing in the knowledge of the Son of God? Because that's what your pastor should be giving you information from the Word of God, teaching you the Word of God. And you should be growing in your knowledge of Jesus Christ. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ, growing up to be like Christ. So the exercise of my gift is to benefit you, to give you the information, the spiritual food, the Word of God that you need to grow up to maturity. So notice how important the gift is of pastor teacher. Now look at his, I bring you this passage because of specifically at this next verse, because it talks about being protected from false doctrine through the uh, listening to the pastor. As a result, we're no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. Who's he writing to? Cheyenne? Who's he writing to? Who's he writing to? What book are we in? Right, the Ephesians. Who was he talking to in, in First Timothy? Not just Timothy, but who? The Ephesians, right? So put two and two together. Paul told them, when Paul wrote this Ephesians, it was 62 A.D., maybe, 61 A.D., and First Timothy was written 63, 64, after he got re released from his first Roman imprisonment. And what was going on in First Timothy? Why? Because false doctrine was being taught. They were teaching false doctrine. They were listening to it. The church was a mess. And here he is telling them that the pastor, the function of his gift, is going to protect you from false doctrine. Now, what's the problem in Ephesus? The very guys who were supposed to protect the body of Christ in Ephesus were doing their jobs, these pastors. Read chapter, we read First Timothy chapter 1. Paul told Timothy, Tell those guys to stop teaching the law, st start teaching the gospel, fulfill their responsibilities. Don't listen to those myths and genealogies. Don't listen to the Judaizers and start teaching the gospel, going back to the gospel. Go, be uh, faithful to your calling. And what happened? False doctrine hit the church as a result of their, uh, many of them failing and fulfilling their responsibilities of teaching the gospel about Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection. And so here we have, that because of that, Paul's telling us by this passage, the, the, the pastor is to protect you from false doctrine, and here we have the pastors in Ephesus not doing that. And we had, many times we have, in our day and age, the implication is today, we have a lot of pastors, are they teaching the Word of God? And a lot of them are. There are a lot of guys that are very great Bible teachers out there teaching quite a bit, and they're faithful to their duties. And However, and this has been true throughout church history, there are many that are not doing that. Now, if you are going to choose a church, you choose a church where you're getting fed. Not, and, and not because you, all your friends are there or because what, you know, you want to you keep up with the Joneses or you want to find a wife, you want to find a husband. I mean, the people to go to churches for all the wrong reasons, many of them. Or you just, you know, you think you, God's impressed because you showed up on Sunday. No, you go there because you're getting fed there. And God doesn't feed you with milk and cookies. He gives you the word of God. Man does, does not live on bread alone, but from every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So I don't know about you, in the natural realm, I eat every day. However, do we see, I want to eat every day spiritually. And if I'm not at Bible class, I'm studying, of course. And before I had this, uh, came out to Iowa to, to be a pastor, I was doing that before them. I was in another ministry, serving in another ministry. Every day, take the Word of God. You'll be amazed. You'll actually be amazed how much better you're able to handle things in life. I didn't say everything would be a highway, but how much better things would be. So here we see verse 14. The gift to pass the teacher is to protect us from false doctrine. And the irony here is this. He said this to the Ephesians. And First Timothy is talking, is the occasion for First Timothy. Paul in that epistle is dealing with the heretical uh, teaching of the Judaizers and these pastors teaching false doctrine in Ephesus. So they're, 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 the pastors are failing here, and also Christians were falling for this false teaching as well. Now go back to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. Now Paul says in 1 Timothy 4, 7, but 
have nothing to do with worldly fables fit for old women. Now, that verb, translated have nothing to do with, that's the verb, and we studied this early. It's the present middle imperative form of the verb, para teoma. Para teoma is, actually means to reject. It doesn't mean have nothing to do with. It means to reject the myths of the Judaizers, and it denotes that Timothy was to refuse to accept or consider these myths of the Judaizers. It also indicates to us that he was ref to refuse to listen to the false teachings being taught. And this verb also denotes another thing, that Paul wants Timothy to refute these myths as well, which is indicated by Paul's urgent request in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, that Timothy commands certain pastors in Ephesus from being occupied with these myths that are based upon an erroneous interpretation of the genealogies of Genesis. It's also indicated by Paul's exhortation in 1 Timothy 1, 18 and 19 that Timothy continue being engaged in spiritual combat by exercising faith in the gospel. Now the word, as I said before, it's in the present middle imperative form. That's important to us. And now this is where I need as the pastor to interpret what the New American Standard says. Your English, the, when you teach first by verse like the way that we do and we go back to the original languages, uh, the NIV or dynamic equivalence is not the, really the translation to, to use. And I wouldn't really use the net Bible. I like both Bibles. They're a different translation. But when you, tr in a setting like this, the way I am, it's better to go with a literal translation, a formal equivalence translation, as they call it, the New American Standard, the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Versions like that, uh, the New American Standard, the English Standard Version, are all little translations. Now, the reason why is because they try to translate the word, and the, as the Greek words come up, they try to render them and, and translate them with a word that is in the order that they found. And so sometimes that makes for a wooden translation, uh, not very good English. However, it's good for, tr for us to teach because it helps me go through the passage, and when things come up, there are uh, some discrepancies, or I need cl to clarify something, uh, this trans type of translation is good to work off of. So here, uh, now in the pres if you look at your translation, it says, but have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women. Now the word have nothing to do with, which is that word that we noted earlier, para uh, teoma, that word actually means to reject, as I said before. It means to reject the myths of the Judaizers. Now, it's in the present middle imperative form. And the force of this present middle imperative, or the, actually say the present imperative, it's what we call a customary present imperative. And the force of it is for Timothy to continue making it his habit of performing this task of rejecting the myths of the Judaizers. It implies, along with Paul's statement in 1 Timothy 1.3, that Timothy was already about performing this task when this letter arrived from Paul. Now, don't miss this. When you see a present imperative form, you could have what we call an aggressive or a customary. Now, the aggressive would mean begin the action. What does that mean to me, Pastor Bill? Well, it, it means everything in interpretation. It means, Timothy, start doing it because you haven't been doing it. Now, that's not the, we know that's not the case for a couple of reasons. In 1 Timothy 1.3, Paul was discussed with Timothy. He says, I'm writing this epistle because he was reminding Timothy of the things they talked about before he left Ephesus for Macedonia. So basically, everything that Paul's saying here to Timothy is a reminder, and it's actually a reminder of things that Timothy is already doing. Another thing we know that Timothy's already doing this is that Paul would never delegate such an important task to, t to someone Unless they were faithful in carrying out, he knew that they would be faithful in carrying out everything that he says in this epistle. So we know based upon those two things that Timothy was already doing this. Now, what does it have to do with the tense of the verb here? Uh, well, it has everything to do with it. It means that Timothy don't, uh, the president parent doesn't mean that, Timothy, you haven't been doing it. I want you to start doing it now. I want, I, what it means is continue doing what you've already been doing. Continue making it your habit. It means that Timothy was doing this. He was habitually doing this. And this is, and he was carrying out what? His task of teaching Paul's doctrine, of the warnings about false teaching, and about why their teaching is wrong. So therefore, what is the implication for pastors? 
we got to go back to Paul's writing, the New Testament, the Lord's teaching, and communicate back to the congregation here in the 21st century what Paul said in the 1st century and bring out the application, the implications of that teaching for our day and age and because that's important because that's going to help us avoid falling victim to false doctrine. So the, the customary present imperative, along with Paul's statements in 1 Timothy 1.3, coupled with the fact that Timothy was, uh, Paul would never delegate such an important task in Ephesus to someone who wouldn't be faithful. He'd give it to somebody he knows is going to be faithful and carry out everything he says. Based upon those three factors, we know that Timothy, Paul saying to Timothy in verse 7, continue making it your habit of doing this. Of what? Rejecting these myths. Remember, when he says have nothing to do, it means actually reject these things. Now, it's in the middle voice, and that's important. It's an intensive middle. It focuses attention on the subject, who's Timothy. What does that mean? It emphasizes his volitional responsibility as a servant of the Lord, to, of Jesus Christ, to reject the myths of the Judaizers. So for me, my what I would say, and what I would take from this, my job, i got to be going, studying and teaching, communicating this epistle accurately to, to my congregation. It emphasizes the pa- Timothy's responsibility as the pastor to fulfill everything that Paul has told him to do in this epistle. Now, the word myths, here we get into the into further the, n- n- the, uh, the nitty-gritty of the passage. The word there uh, that's translated, uh, fables, have nothing to do with worldly fables. The word fables there, remember, is mythos. And this word describes the teaching of the Judaizers from the perspective that it's unhistorical. And it's not based upon tr- a truth or fact. Remember what I told you in chapter 1, and I've reiterated. They, Paul says in 1 Timothy 1, 3, and 4, Timothy, tell these guys to stop o- being occupied with uh, myths and endless genealogies. The, the myths were from a misinterpretation of the, interpretation of the genealogies. We know this from Jewish writings. This is some of the things that they would do. And they, they would have come up with all these legends. They're not based upon fact. The gospel is based upon fact. Historical event, historical events, historical person, Jesus Christ. So, on the other hand, the Judaizers were not doing that. And Paul saying, have nothing to do. Continue to make it your habit, Timothy, of having nothing to do with that baloney. So what would be the implication for both us as pastors, us as pastors in the 21st century and you as a Christian? Don't, don't waste your time listening or being occupied with a bunch of garbage. You know, there's so many things that Christians listen to. It's amazing. I listen to you know, this, and, and they're occupied. They, they're so occupied. I'll give you an example. Um, there's a, somebody I, in my past, he's big time into conspiracy things. Now, I believe there's conspiracy. I believe that there's the conspiracy. I know Titus is a big conspiracy buff. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, you know, there are conspiracies. The greatest conspiracy is Satan, obviously. There's conspiracies because there's a, the devil around and the kingdom of darkness. How this person goes into extremes, and he would be so occupied with tracking down these various conspiracies. I mean, he read everything, occult stuff. And it, he actually admitted to me, it was starting to m- make his mind, because he was reading such dark stuff, that it was affecting his thing. I said, of course it is. You should be occupied with the Word of God. See, if you're occupied with the Word of God, you'll have the discernment to find out what the false teaching is. You don't have to be occupied with the false teaching to know that it's wrong, to find out why it's wrong. Be occupied with the truth. The truth, the gospel, the word of God gives you the litmus test in which to measure doctrines, different teaching. Because if you know your Bible, you'll be able to say, well, that's not right. Because what the Bible says contradicts what they say. So this person would be so occupied with these myths. He'd come up with these things, and some of these things were like way out there. In fact, I had a conversation not too long ago, and he had he gotten worse. It was really sad because I, I love him dearly. And he just, his mind, I mean, he was coming up with these things. It's like, where's that in the Bible? I mean, he was getting into the the, uh, the different things, uh, the giants in, in the Old Testament. Like, they were killed, uh, the, the Nephilim are not the same Nephilim in numbers as the one in Genesis. Because the ones in Genesis were killed with the flood of Noah. I mean, just a simple chronology tells you that. But he was like, you know, 
the, you know, the Nephilim are still around today. So you, get no, you get no exegetical basis to prove that. You have to go through, jump through hoops to come up with that. So he's occupied with myths. That's exactly what Paul's talking about. Christians and pastors shouldn't be occupied with this garbage. They should be occupied with the truth, the word of God, the gospel, the Bible, and, st- and, and accurately interpret it and not make it say what you want it to say. You've got to be objective and listen to the Holy Spirit. So this word, fables, trans- in verse 7, translated fables, mythos, it describes the teaching of the Judaizers from the perspective that it's unhistorical and not based upon fact. What is the gospel? The gospel is in direct contrast to that. The gospel is absolute truth. Why do we know that? Because it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. How do we know that? Fulfillment of prophecy. It's also it's because it's rooted in historical events. The crucifixion, the death and resurrection of Christ, his ascension and session are historical facts. And also, he's an historical individual. So we see that the Quran is not based upon that. To put out a body of literature out there that people revere, it's written by one person. I would be suspicious about one person having the authorship of a book that's supposed to govern people's lives and eternal destiny. Whereas the Bible, God uses how many authors? At least 40 authors uh, over 2,500 years from various backgrounds, from different centuries, different periods, different occupations, and they all agree. Okay? And they speak about, and the, the archaeology has, has backed up over and over again the Bible. Over and over again it's come forward as supporting what the, the events that are recorded in the Bible as being historical facts. So we see here the gospel is absolute truth. This is what Paul wants Timothy to be occupied with, and he is. But he wants these pastors in Ephesus and the whole Ephesian Christian community to stay away from that stuff. It's not going to get you to grow up to spiritual maturity. In fact, I was talking to that person I mentioned earlier. I said, how is that going to get you to grow up to spiritual maturity? All this stuff that's like nothing really built, is really not based upon the Bible. And you really didn't have an answer. It's like, you know, you know, too many people are, and I find this with intelligent people who have got a lot on the ball. Sometimes, they trust in their own intellect and rationalism rather than what the Word of God says. A, a great intellect like Paul and a great mentality, rational thought, and be able to think well is a great help with the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But there's sometimes they, they come up with things and they come up with their own, their interpretation are terrible. And so this old friend of mine from way back, he had no interpretive skills and he was just, he just pulled things out of context, pulling things like he'd be chronologically incorrect. And, you know, it was just sad to hear. But he's an individual that is rejected, doesn't think he needs a pastor. And I think, and I know for a fact, this guy, he likes to be the Dalai Lama. He likes to be, you know, the guy, I mean, he was the guru back in our day when I, we were kids growing up. You know, and everybody followed him around like he knew the answer, you know. And uh, he did. He's messed up. He screwed up in his head believer, but he, because he's paying attention to myths and occupied with myths, he's not, he's, and he rejects the authority of his pastor, he can't be protected from the false doctrine that's being and hitting him because he, he, resent, he doesn't want to listen to a pastor, doesn't want to submit to a pastor. He thinks he knows better. So that's just plain arrogance. So now the word that's modifying, the word fabulous, the word that's modifying this word myths, uh, mythos, uh, uh, fables, the word Vevilos means worldly. It's translated worldly in your Bibles, and it's modifying that word from this, mythos, and it's describing. When he says worldly, it's describing. In fact, does the New American Standard Trans? Yeah, worldly fables. The word worldly is describing these myths as being directly related to Satan's cosmic system and are not related in any way whatsoever to the gospel and God's plan for the church. It describes these myths as having absolutely no godly purpose whatsoever. So, I always, when you look, whatever, you, you know, one of the things, one of the things you got to pray for is God protect you from that sort of thing. You, from, you know, myths, to be grounded in the gospel, be a student of the word of God, and learn from your pastor, teacher, whoever he is, how to learn from him the word of God, and learn 
uh, to uh, and learn how to interpret the Bible as you follow his lead. He'll, he'll help you over years as you watch him interpret. He will help you interpret the Bible. And you look at you can pick up your translation and you'll know your Bible a lot better. You'll have it, when you read it for yourself, which you should do, and I do every day. If you read it for yourself in an English translation of your choice, you'll get more out of it based upon what you've learned in Bible class. So the word that's translated, you know, it says, uh, but have nothing to do with worldly fables. And then he says, fit only for old women. Now, the word for fit for only old women is the adjective, as we noted also before, graotis. Graotis describes the type of stories told by old women that are speculative, and non-historical and not true, and thus lack any value to the Christian. Gordon Fee, commenting on this word, writes that this word is a sarcastic expression often used in philosophical polemic comparing an opponent's position to the tales perpetuated by older women of those cultures as they would sit around weaving and the like, end of quote. Now, I know people, women in the 21st century, Will probably, even Christian women will take so much offense to what Paul said. This is one of the things that they criticize Paul in liberal scholastic circles today. Paul was a misogynist. I mean, he would criticize old women. Well, you know, back in Paul's day, and not too long ago, old women would sit around knitting and stuff, and they would spend time together, and they would tell myths, old crazy old wives tale. I mean, I think of some of the things my grandmother used to say which we know is not factually right, you know. For instance, I was watching this thing that well, if you eat, you know, eat a lot of food and you, and you jump in the water and you swim, that, you know, you're going to get a cramp and die. Well, I watched the show and, 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 uh, and, and that's not true. The doctors said, you know, they went down through these things. That's not true. Now, somebody's going to write me and say, that is true. I, I drowned it in a pool. I had so much food. You know, Titus will write me an email. Well, Jody gave me a big lasagna at dinner, and I went out in my, my kid's little pool, and I, I was practically drowned. I had to ask Jody to give me mouth to mouth and save me and stuff, you know, stuff like that. But anyways, so they would, what Paul's saying with this word is that it's, it's sarcastic. When people, when the Greeks and the Romans used to debate each other and have arguments, they would use this kind of expression, saying basically when they wanted to rebuke or debunk another guy's, their opponent's, teaching or his doctrine or his argument, they would use this expression to refute them and to show how ridiculous their position is. That's what the way Paul's using it here. He's not picking on older women, but it is, he's saying this is the sign that, that this is the type of teaching the Judaizers have that it's no better than these old, you know, old wives tale that granny has to say. Now, therefore, this word uh, translated uh, uh, fit only for old women this word means characteristic of the tales told by old women. And it's modifying this word for myths, mythos. And kraotis is describing these myths as being like the types of stories told by gossipy old women that are speculative and non-historical and not truth and thus lack any value to the Christian. It's interesting as we get to chapter 5 when Paul talks about widows. And he says this in his writings, you know, he, says, he tells the women, you know, not to be gossips, you know. He doesn't say the men to do that because he knows the ladies have that weakness to be gossipy. And it's true. It's inspired by the Holy Spirit, Paul says. But so what we see here, I mentioned that because when he uses this phrase, fit only for old women, he's saying that these, these, these teaching of the Judaizers, these myths are nothing there's very much like the, the stories told by old gossipy women that are non-historical, not based upon truth or facts, and thus they lack any value to the Christian. So he couldn't be any more stronger in his denunciation of the teaching of the Judaizers, which he mentions in chapter 1 and also chapter, more importantly, in chapter 4, uh, verses 1 through 5. Now let's go for the... The, adversative, the, the second adversative clause, the command here to Timothy directly. It says in verse 7, but have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women, or as we can say, continue to make it your habit of rejecting uh, worldly fables, myths that are characteristic of old gossipy women, you could say. Then he says, on the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. What a great statement that is. 
and very broad. We have, first of all, the uh, second person singular, present active imperative form of the verb, gymnazo, which is translated here, discipline. Great word, which we're going to spend a little time on. And then we have the conjunction, the post-positive use of the conjunction, the, uh, translated on the other hand correctly. And then we have the accusative form of the reflexive pronoun, say out to, translated yourself. It's emphasizing Timothy's volitional responsibility here. And then we have a prepositional phrase, the preposition pros, which is uh, expressing a purpose. It's translated correctly here for the purpose of. And its object is the accusative form of the noun, a word we've seen in this epistle a couple of times, afsevia. We saw it in 1 Timothy 3.16, the mystery of godliness or the way of godliness. Now the word that's translated on the other hand, the conjunction that, it's introducing a command here that stands in contrast with the previous command we just studied. Therefore, the contrast is between rejecting the myths of the Judaizers with that of obeying the gospel, which produces godliness. Now, the word translated discipline is a great word. It's, it's, he's take, he's, with this word, Paul's using an athletic uh, metaphor. He's creating a metaphor here. So he said at the beginning of the, of the class, Paul was a man of his times. Uh, if he lived in our day and age with the emphasis on sports in our society, if he lived in America in the 21st century like I do in America with sports being a big thing, he would use sports analogies. He'd use military analogies. He did in the first century. And the reason why that is, a good teacher will take from every, things of everyday life and make a spiritual application for them, uh, for, the, for, the, for the audience, for his, his, his audience so that they can understand God's will for their lives. So Paul's doing that here for Timothy. He's taken this word, gymnazo, and it's a word that they used in classical Greek. It was used in secular Greek literature. Secular meanings it wasn't Christian. It was used in secular Greek literature to refer to an athlete training in the nude, as was done in the Greek games. See, when they had track and field games among the Greeks in the first century, when Paul went to see, like in, the, in, in Paul's day, they had various games. Today we have the Olympic Games, right? I think the Pan American Games, I don't know if they're still around. But they had the Pythian Games, they had the Corinthian Games, they had the Nemean Games, the games in Thebes and Argos, and also the Olympic Game and the Isthmian Games. Okay, they had all these various games. Now when Paul went to see them, and he obviously went to see them like a lot of people did, they were great events, the athletes would be naked. They portrayed and they performed, uh, they uh, competed, in these events, naked. We don't do that today, although some of the clothes that they wear now, and they're, 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 they're tight-fitting clothes, they might as well be naked, some of them. But that's how they did it in the first century. I'm not saying we should do it in the first century. I'm just telling you what Paul uh, was using this word, where it was taken from. Now here, he's using this word, and it means to train yourself, Timothy. It means discipline yourself. I love this word, because it's one of the things, it brings out the concept, that I always tell over and over my people to do. Discipline. One of the most important things, if you want to grow up to be like Jesus Christ, which is God the plan, Father's plan for your life and my life, you need to be disciplined. You got to you gotta pick up your Bible. You got to come to Bible class. Be disciplined in that. You got to pray every day. As an individual and with your church. Corporate prayer. Well, I don't see a lot of Christians doing that. That's that's not doing your best. It's not disciplining yourself. So we need to do these things. If you want to be good at anything in sports or anything in life, practice. You have to have, to have discipline. A doctor. A doctor can't be a great doctor. I know, I know a couple of doctors who follow us on the Internet. And they're great doctors because they're, they study. They're, dis, they, they, they're able to get to the positions they were as doctors because they disciplined themselves. It took a lot of discipline to go through school, medical school and everything, to get to the point where they're the doctor they are today and practice in medicine. It takes a lot of discipline to get to their point. If you want to be a great lawyer, it takes a lot of discipline to be a great lawyer. You have to learn the law. You have to spend hours and hours studying. Same thing with if you want to be a great pastor. You've got to be hours and hours and hours of reading and studying the Word of God and putting it into practice. And the same thing God wants us to do as Christians. Christians don't get a lot of and don't enjoy their relationship with God because they don't put anything in it. They don't have any discipline. They're like me in golf. I go at best once a week. I'd like to go more, but I can't do that right now. But if I went, I go once a week, I'm out there thinking I'm going to go out and shoot 
you know, I, I have unreasonable expectations many times when I go golfing. Now, the course I go to, I, I, I want to break 90, okay? If I break 90, that's great. To me, that's great. Because I only play once a week. But that's all I'm going to get good at is if I could play seven days a week and could play all these type of hours, I'm going to tell you right now, I can shoot in the 70s. But I don't, I can't, I can't devote that kind of time to it. So I can only do what? Once a week. Well, that's like a lot of Christians. It's once a week. And they don't get proficient and have a grow in their relationship with God. And there's no, they don't, don't have this enthusiasm for the Word of God. They don't have this enthusiasm for life that the Word of God can give you. Because they don't put the effort into it. They're like me on the golf course. They play once a week. And that's not how God planned it. So this word, gymnazo, translated to discipline here, it describes Timothy as actively and vigorously pursuing the goal of godliness just as an athlete in the Greek athletic games would vigorously pursue the goal of reaching the stone pillar first, which marked the finish line in the ancient games. So by using this word, he's using track and field imagery in order to, to describe to Timothy pursuing Christ likeness or spiritual maturity. What Paul has in mind here with his word is a runner sprinting for the tape, giving everything he can to cross the finish line and win the prize. And the prize in the ancient world for Paul was the bravion. And the Stephanos was the crown they gave you. Bravion was the prize they gave you. In some cases, if you won, you would get you wouldn't have to pay taxes, or your kids wouldn't have to pay taxes. What a great prize that was. Well, there was some, a lot of other things that they had, too. But that's what he's talking about. So he's got, he's trying to describe Timothy in athletic terms, track and field imagery, because in order so Timothy gets what Paul's saying, I want you to give all you've got to become like Jesus Christ, to, 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 to exercise godliness, to train yourself to become like Jesus Christ, which is godliness. Do it as hard as you can, just like a runner is trying to win a race in the Olympic Games or the Isthmian Games. And that's what he wants for us to do. What's the application for us as pastors, implication for us in the 21st century and Christians who aren't pastors? God wants us to, to give every discipline ourselves, train ourselves, give it all we got, like a runner stretching for the tape, to become like Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about, people. Everything else is context of life. So Paul's, in effect, saying this word, gymnazo, denotes Timothy's zealous pursuit of Christ's likeness for the execution of the Father's plan for his life. He is, in effect, saying here with this verb that Timothy is to pursue the objective of executing the Father's plan for his life, which is the attainment of Christ's likeness, by experiencing identification with Christ in his death and resurrection. This word, in the present imperative, it's a curse, the Mary present imperative, as I noted before, and the force of it is for Timothy to continue making it his habit of disciplining himself for godliness. So what it means is that Timothy is already doing it, and he wants Paul to continue making it his habit. Now this metaphor, Paul uses track and field metaphor in, uh, in his writings all over the place. Um, hold your place. Quickly, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Great passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 23. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 23. I took you here because I want to show you some of the athletic track and field imagery that Paul, or metaphors that Paul uses in his writings. Speaking of himself in 1 Corinthians 9, 23, he says, I do all things for the sake of the gospel so that I might become a fellow partaker of it. Ask yourself a question. Are you doing the same as a Christian? That's a rhetorical question that only you and God can answer. Look at verse 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Meaning become like Christ. Do God's will. Run. I mean, when you want to win a race, Cheyenne, right? 
Well, you run, right? Cheyenne's real fast. She jumped 411 and high, uh, was it the high jump. That's pretty good for a fifth grader, right? That's like amazing. Well, who knows? We might have a next Olympic champion here. Remember me when you're famous. But anyways, so when you run, right? You go like, is that embarrassing? When you go run, do you go like, oh, you trot? You just go, or do you go, you run as fast as you, like when you're racing Tyler. If I had a race here, would Giant, would you, would you trot or you, would you let, would you just let him win? Like you run so hard so you whoop his butt, right? And he would do vice versa, right? My money's on Cheyenne. But anyways, so you, oh, sorry. <laughs> so anyways, so this is the idea. We're supposed to run hard. Now look at verse 25. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. Then they do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So he says, therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim, without a purpose in life. I box in such a way as not beating the air. But I discipline my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. He's saying, I want to uh, back up what I teach. i got to live it too. Otherwise, I'm disqualified. But if you didn't compete according to the games, the rules, and they trained for like 10 months, in Paul's day, if you, if, you, if you messed up and you didn't do exactly what you're supposed to do with the rules, you were disqualified. That's what he's alluding to here. He's taking that imagery. So he's saying that, you know, I like this path, what he says, I discipline my body and make it my slave. Uh, how many times do you hear Christians go, oh, Sunday morning, it's raining out. I don't want, I'm going to roll over, honey. And we, go, we won't come, come to Bible class. I'm just too tired. It's just, you know what? That person's, a, his body is his slave. Instead of making his body his slave, he's a slave to his body. And I'll tell you right now, there are many times that I, I, I don't want to get up in the morning, you know, I'm, oh, you know but, you know, a lot of, there are times I don't want to get up and study. I got to get up and study. I don't roll out of bed at 11 o'clock and put my boots up and go, oh, dad, what am I doing? I mean, obviously, all you have to do is look at the website and you can tell the guy works, okay, and how much often I teach. But I have to, I have to discipline myself. I pray, I pray every day, and I, pray, I study every day, I, I, there, are, there are things I, I do every day, every day, every day. I have to discipline myself, even when I don't feel like it. I remember one time I had, uh, I tore, a, I was wearing contacts, and I tore a layer off my cornea. I was at work or at, at some place eating, and yeah, I didn't know it, but that night I, the, the thing popped, and I tore a layer off my cornea. I don't know if you've ever had something that is so painful. It's like sticking something in your eye, Okay. So it was, I get up the next morning to study, and I notice my I, I'm having problems with my eye. It's like something was, was burning a little bit. So I I studied, and I get up, I get up, and I go and uh, I go to work, and my eyes inflammable. My boss goes, "You gotta go, you gotta get to work. You gotta go to the hospital." So I go to the hospital the doctor goes, "Yeah, you, you tore a layer off your cornea. You're lucky you didn't lose your sight." So he goes, "So I go back, and I you know I, I get the you know I get my sunglasses on and stuff, and you know." I get up the next morning, and I'm like, you know, I just felt terrible, like, and I'm trying to study, I'm like, and I did it, I did it, I, I was so disciplined myself, hey, one thing you can say about me, is like, I'm ugly, and I'm a lousy teacher, and blah, 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 no, really, I mean, some people might have some points there, but one thing you can say, you don't outwork me, I, I am so disciplined in what I do, I don't care who you are, I'm, I can have one eye, well, I'm like this, and, I mean, there have been times where I've been sick to death in my stomach, and I'm up there studying and stuff. I mean, I, for me to not get up and study, I must be really don't feel well. Okay? So what I'm saying to you is, and forgive me for using myself as an example. I didn't mean to brag. I, was trying, I wasn't trying to brag. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to give you an example and discipline yourself. Okay? Now, we see here, that's what he's talking about. Now, uh, go, hop over to Philippians. Look at Philippians chapter 3. All right. You there yet, Tyler? Look at verse 10. Philippians 3.10. Philippians 3.10. Here's Paul's, here's Paul's objective. And it's related to godliness. Remember Paul says, exercise or discipline yourself for godliness? This is how you do it in verse 10 and 11. That I may know him and the power of Christ, he's speaking of, and the power of his resurrection. Look what he says. 
the fellowship of his suffering. So when you go through tough things, don't complain about it. Maybe God is trying to help you experience the fellowship of his sufferings. It's a good thing. Being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, that I've arrived. But I press on that I may hold, lay hold of that which, which, which I was also laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Jesus. Brethren, I don't regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind. When you're running in a race, unless you're way ahead, you're not looking back and see who's chasing you. Otherwise, you'll not get to the old finish line. And he says, reaching forward to what lies ahead. Again, in the Greek, it's using an athletic metaphor, track and field metaphor. He's stretching. Here's the verse that really gives it away. He says, I press on toward the goal for, out of the, for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The word press on, the oko, it talks about pressing for the tape, sprinting for the tape. It's not, it's basically the idea there. So this is, Paul's using this athletic metaphor again. What is he trying to be like? Jesus Christ, right? We just said that. That's the goal for us. You know, we don't come to Bible class so we can get real smart. And, you know, we go, oh, I know this passage. And I'm gonna, you know, and it's for a purpose. It's so that we can grow in love to a God and each other to grow up to be like Jesus Christ. Uh, go back to 1 Timothy. I throw you another passage, uh, but go back to, I don't have enough time. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. Other passages you can look up in your own time. 2 Timothy 4, verses 7 and 8. Galatians 2, 2. Hebrews chapter 1, verse, chapter uh, 12, verses 1 and 2. All those verses talk about uh, talk about, use the athletic metaphor, running a race. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 3, 1. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Galatians 2, 2. And also Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Now, uh, what we see here, that word, it says, uh, discipline yourself. If you look at verse 4, it says, on the adverse of the second statement. On the other hand, discipline yourself. As I said before, the word yourself is say out to. And it indicates that Timothy, as the subject, is also the object of this verb, discipline, yimnazo. And it's used to highlight or emphasize Timothy's responsibility in obeying this command. Then we say, what's the purpose here? For godliness. To discipline yourself for godliness. What's godliness? That's the word sevia. Godliness refers to proper Christian attitude and conduct that is produced by the Holy Spirit as a result of exercising faith and the Word of God, which in turn results in obedience to the Word of God. The words correctly translated here, godliness, in the sense, it means godliness in the sense that by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Christian is conforming their thinking and conduct according to the Father's will, which is revealed by the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Godliness means that the Christian is conforming their attitude and conduct to the will of the Father as a result of having faith in Jesus Christ, our Spirit's teaching, in the Word of God, resulting in obedience to the Father's will. So the Christian's faith in the Word of God, as we've noted many times, appropriates the power of the Holy Spirit. And that results in us conforming our attitude and conduct to the will of, of the Father. And the will of the Father is revealed by the Spirit and the Word of God. So when we appropriate by faith the Spirit's teaching that we're crucified, died, buried, raised, and seated with Christ, and that constitutes worshiping God. Hold your place. Look at uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Paul alludes this kind of thing. This concept of godliness. But he doesn't call it godliness explicitly in chapter 12 of Romans. Look at Romans chapter 12, verse 1. But he explains what godliness is in this verse. Or the mechanics of it, I should say. So godliness has these ideas. You're conforming your will, or your, your mind and thinking, and your conduct to what God's Word says. Who's speaking to us through the Word of God? The Spirit. What is He speaking to us about? The will of the Father for our lives. Now, when we take on faith what that says, we're going to obey God's commands and prohibitions. Now, that's worshiping God. When our mind is in conformity to God's Word, and our conduct is as well, that's worshiping God. A lot of Christians think, if I'm singing, I'm worshiping God. If you're not filled with the Spirit, and your mind is not thinking the thoughts of God, and you're just doing it because you're entertained, you're entertained by it, or something, you know, you can sing all you want. You're not, you're, not, you're not exercising godliness. You're not being a godly person. 
Godliness begins, godliness means becoming like God, acting like God. You can't act like God, act like Jesus Christ who is God, if you don't know how to think like him. And you don't know how to think like him because if you don't know the word of God, you don't know how to think like him then. And therefore you can't worship God the way he wants. It all starts with your thinking. That's why Paul says, don't be occupied with these worldly myths because it's going to screw up your thinking. And if you're thinking screwed up, then you're not going to be uh, like Jesus Christ. You're not going to be exercising godliness. You're going to be ungodly because your thoughts are screwed up. That's why we got to be very careful what we watch, what we allow to go into our eye gate. Because we're a very visual society. And we've got to be very careful of that. Because Satan would like to use the media, internet, Anything he can to grab a hold of our minds, to have us occupied with these things. Hey, let me tell you something. For instance, I like music, you know that. I love music. Now, one of the things that God can, and one of Satan, Satan might try to do is, because I love music, I was, I was like when I'm going on my trip this with my family, my brothers and I and friends, we, we gather around, you know, like, and we'll play old Beatles songs and stuff. And, you know, stuff. So I've been learning all these Beatles songs. Well, if I don't watch out, that's a, all right. There's nothing wrong in itself learning a Beatles song. But if I'm so occupied where I spend my whole day and thinking about it all the time, that's, that's going to screw me up because that's not what God wants me to do. So this is why I say Satan will try to use even things that we are all right in themselves, and nothing, but it becomes bad because of our attitude toward the things. Like money. Nothing wrong with money. There's nothing anything wrong with money. Money is inanimate. But, or money is just... Money is just money. It's, not, it's nothing evil in itself. It's not a moral, rational creature, so it can't be evil. No, we make it evil because we think wrongly toward it. We love it. We covet it. That's when it becomes evil. So your mind is a very important thing. Look at Romans 12.1. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice. Don't miss that. If you present yourself, your body, with a living, holy sacrifice, that's speaking of your conduct. And that's an acceptable to God, which is your what? Your spiritual service of worship. Godliness is, is, is results in worshiping God. Okay? Now, in verse 2, it's actually saying, consequently, don't, because of this, don't be conformed to this world, the standards of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? So that you may prove, demonstrate through your conduct, what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. That's a perfect, those two verses are a perfect illustration of how to exercise godliness, to live an acceptable, a godly life. Now go back to 1 Timothy 4, 7 and we'll close. I'm running a little late here. Thank you for hanging in there with me. You haven't fallen asleep. Paul says in 1 Timothy 4, 7, but have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of of godliness. So godliness involves the Christian exercising faith in the Spirit's teaching in the Word of God that they crucified, died, buried, raised, and seated with Christ, and that will result in the Christian thinking and acting like Christ. So therefore, Paul's commanding Timothy in verse 7 to continue making it his habit of disciplining himself for the purpose of godliness, meaning he's to discipline himself and conforming his attitude and conduct to the will of the Father, which constitutes worshiping him. Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would challenge us with the things that we've heard this evening. Help us in the application of these things, the implications of the things that we've learned here this evening. And we pray that it would help us to continue to grow to be up to become like your son, Jesus Christ, and help us in our daily walk with your son and yourself and the Holy Spirit. And our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray.